Pharaoh Khufu Unveiled, The Man Behind the Great Pyramid of Giza Chapter 1, Introduction Welcome to a journey over 4,600 years into the past, to an Egypt you've never seen. Forget what you think you know about the Great Pyramid of Giza, this isn't just about monumental stones. We're here to explore the man behind the marvel, Pharaoh Khufu. From his rise to power to his influence on Egyptian culture, we'll demystify the myths and dive deep into the reality of his life and reign. So, fasten your seatbelts. You're about to time travel to ancient Egypt to unravel one of history's most enigmatic rulers. Welcome to the life and times of Khufu. Chapter 2, The Dynasty and Early Life Picture the grandeur of ancient Egypt in its heyday, around 2600 BCE, a kingdom of unprecedented innovation, with architects daring to dream higher than ever before. This was the fourth dynasty, a period that would produce some of the most iconic landmarks in human history. And into this extraordinary era, a child was born to Pharaoh Snefru, a leader who himself had revolutionized pyramid construction. This child would be named Khufu, and from his first breath, the weight of a dynasty rested upon his infant shoulders. Khufu's father, Snefru, was not just a pharaoh but a pioneer, a man who experimented with pyramid shapes, leading to the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid. It was a time of innovation in art, medicine, and governance. With these groundbreaking achievements as a backdrop, young Khufu came of age in an environment that melded tradition with innovation, shaping his perspectives and ambitions in unprecedented ways. Now imagine the royal palace at the heart of ancient Memphis, opulent quarters, bustling courtiers, and the best tutors in the realm. Here in this seat of culture and power, Khufu's early education unfurled. He learned to read hieroglyphs, studied the movements of the stars with priests, and mastered statecraft under the watchful eye of his mother, Queen Hedefears. Each lesson wasn't just knowledge, it was preparation for divine kingship. But let us not forget, the Egyptian royal family was large, and competition was fierce. Khufu was one of several brothers, each eyeing the throne with both a sense of entitlement and trepidation. Facts are few, but ancient texts hint at sibling rivalries, intensified by the immense power that would someday be won or lost. The royal upbringing was not all rivalry and lessons. There were also the hunting expeditions along the Nile, where young Khufu would have honed his skills as a warrior. And there were the grand ceremonies at temples where Khufu watched his father communicate with the gods, instilling in him the spirituality that is inseparable from Egyptian kingship. As we delve deeper into this period, we must acknowledge our guides in this journey of discovery, Egyptologists like Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass, whose groundbreaking work has pieced together the nuances of life in 4th Dynasty Egypt. The fragments of papyri, the inscriptions on ancient tombs, and the artifacts unearthed from excavation sites, each is a puzzle piece helping us to assemble an accurate picture of Khufu's early years. So as the sun sets over the Nile, casting golden hues over a kingdom at the height of its power, we see young Khufu, a prince, yes, but also a dreamer, a student, and a competitor, destined to leave an indelible mark on this ancient civilization. Chapter 3, Ascending to Power Imagine, if you will, the great city of Memphis in its prime, a center of trade, culture, and politics. The air is thick with the smell of incense and the anticipation of a change in leadership. Sneferu, the great architect pharaoh, has passed away. It is around 2580 BCE, more than four and a half millennia from where we stand today in 2023. The throne is empty, and into this vacuum steps Khufu, a man trained from birth to inherit not just a kingdom but a legacy. But a pharaoh's ascension was no simple ceremony, it was a cosmic event, designed to align the realms of gods and men. The rituals were elaborate and steeped in tradition, from the opening of the mouth to rejuvenate the deceased Sneferu's spirit, to the coronation feast that would officially mark Khufu's rule. Each rite was a coded message, signaling the continuity of the divine rule to the gods above and subjects below. Yet for all its pomp and ceremony, this was also a time of immense vulnerability. 
Khufu faced the daunting task of consolidating power at home and projecting it abroad. We must remember, ancient Egypt was not a monolithic state but a tapestry of tribes, cultures, and gods, each with their own loyalties and ambitions. Our historical consultants, such as famed Egyptologists like Sulima Ikram and Joyce Tilsley, have helped us peel back the layers on what exactly this meant for a new pharaoh. In a society steeped in bureaucracy, Khufu had to appoint his own viziers, high priests, and commanders. In an age without telecommunication, how does a ruler extend his will? He did so through an elaborate administrative structure, regional governors, tax collectors, architects, and scribes, all appointed to carry out the pharaoh's designs. Ancient papyri reveal the names of some of these key players, like Himiyunu, who is believed to have been Khufu's vizier and perhaps even a relative. Still, internal affairs were just the tip of the iceberg. Egypt had always been a player on the international stage. The Sinai Peninsula to the northeast was rich in valuable turquoise, while Nubia to the south offered gold. Maintaining these trade routes and ensuring the flow of these precious resources were crucial, and the military muscle to back it up was non-negotiable. Here, too, Khufu had to prove his mettle. Then came the spiritual responsibilities. As son of Are, Khufu was the intermediary between gods and humans. It was believed that the prosperity of the kingdom lay in the balance of these divine relationships. So, Khufu took on the role of chief priest, ensuring that the gods were honored in monumental ways, which leads us to the topic we're all waiting for, but more on that later. So, as we retrace the footsteps of Khufu through the corridors of power, remember this was a man balancing tradition with innovation, divine mandate with earthly concerns, and above all, a legacy with a future yet to be written. Chapter 4, The Man and His Court Imagine the royal court of Khufu as the ancient world's equivalent of the modern-day Oval Office or Downing Street, a hub of decision-making, a crucible of intellect and influence. But this was a court unlike any other, for it operated in the context of a divine kingship. Every decision here wasn't merely political, it was cosmic, reverberating through both heaven and earth. It was here, surrounded by hand-picked advisors, that Khufu became the pharaoh history remembers. Among the most pivotal figures in Khufu's inner circle was his vizier, Himiyunu. As nephew to Khufu and a man of prodigious talents, Himiyunu was more than an advisor, he was a confidant, a master architect, and the de facto prime minister. Inscriptions on tomb walls and remnants of ancient texts sing praises of his wisdom. Himiyunu's influence was not merely administrative but intellectual, and it is widely believed that he was instrumental in planning some of Egypt's most monumental structures, yes, including the pyramid that we'll delve into later. But Himiyunu was not alone. A cadre of high priests, such as those of the god Ra, had the ear of the pharaoh. These were the men who ensured that the kingdom's spiritual health was in balance, an equilibrium crucial for the prosperity of the realm. Their role wasn't just ritualistic, their advice extended to matters of state, especially when it came to diplomatic ties with foreign kingdoms that shared similar gods or religious practices. Equally critical were the military commanders, men seasoned by desert campaigns and riverine warfare. Names like Ankaf, another of Khufu's relatives, come up in historical accounts. They were the muscle ensuring that Egypt's borders remained sacrosanct, and their counsel would have been indispensable during times of external threats or territorial expansions. Then there were the scribes and scholars, the unsung heroes of any kingdom. Men like Mirror, whose personal logs have given us invaluable insights into the daily lives of people in Khufu's era. These were the men who recorded history as it unfolded, who accounted for every sack of grain, who listed every block of limestone. Their role was bureaucratic but vital, and Khufu's court would have been filled with these educated men, diligently jotting down each royal decree. It's worth noting that this wasn't a male-only enterprise. Queens and royal consorts such as Maritites and Hanutsen wielded significant influence, often serving as diplomatic links to other states and holding religious roles that were vital to the spiritual well-being of the kingdom. 
Thanks to the excavations led by experts like Rainer Stadelman and Salim Hassan, among others, we are piecing together the intricate tapestry of Khufu's court. Archaeological digs have unearthed seals, inscriptions, and even statues that help us recreate this enigmatic world, a world that functioned as the brain and the heart of ancient Egypt's most ambitious era. So come along as we pull back the curtain on the advisors, the confidants, and the visionaries who stood alongside Khufu. These were the individuals shaping policy, strategy, and destiny in a land where gods and men coexisted in an intricate dance of power. Chapter 5, Khufu as a Ruler Imagine holding the reins of an empire so grand, it becomes synonymous with magnificence for millennia to come. Such was the life of Khufu, a pharaoh who, contrary to the one-dimensional portrait often painted of him, was a multifaceted leader. In this chapter, we are stepping away from the shadow of the Great Pyramid to focus on Khufu, the ruler, a man of governance, military strategy, and, yes, divine pretensions. The economic vitality of ancient Egypt was inextricably linked to the Nile, and Khufu knew this better than anyone. With inscriptions mentioning his reforms in irrigation and agriculture, he was acutely aware that the lifeblood of his kingdom flowed through this great river. Vast networks of canals were either constructed or renovated under his reign, boosting agricultural output and, subsequently, state revenue. This wasn't mere landscaping, this was economic strategy at its best. But Khufu's governance wasn't limited to home affairs. The annals of history, albeit fragmented, mention military expeditions that took place during his rule. These weren't just for territorial expansion but also aimed at securing critical trade routes and valuable resources such as copper and turquoise from Sinai. Khufu was no armchair strategist, he was a tactical planner with an eye for the long game. However, the reality of Khufu's rule wasn't universally rosy. His reign has long been the subject of intense debate among Egyptologists and historians. The famed inventory stela, though controversial and possibly of a much later date, speaks of Khufu closing temples and taking over priestly duties himself. Could this have been an attempt to centralize religious power? Such actions, if true, might not have endeared him to the priesthood or the common folk. While some describe him as a visionary and a pioneer, others paint a more tyrannical picture. In a move that exemplifies his complex character, Khufu standardized weights and measures throughout Egypt. While this may seem like a bureaucratic footnote, it revolutionized trade, agriculture, and taxation, laying the groundwork for a unified state. Yet, at the same time, vast segments of the population were mobilized for his monumental building projects. These were not slaves, as often mischaracterized, but paid laborers, though one wonders at what cost to their personal freedoms and community lives. From records such as the Palermo Stone, we gather hints of annual cattle counts and taxation systems. Khufu's administration was a behemoth of moving parts, and he was at its helm, steering its course through a landscape of divine obligations, popular sentiments, and geopolitical complexities. Make no mistake, Khufu was not a ruler of small measures or humble plans. His policies, whether you consider them enlightened or exploitative, left an indelible mark on Egypt. It shaped its culture, its military might, and its architectural grandiosity for centuries to come. So as we turn the pages of crumbling papyri, decode hieroglyphs etched in stone, and interpret the voices of long-gone scribes and priests, we invite you to see Khufu in a new light. He wasn't just a pharaoh, he was a politician, a warrior, a reformer, and a man of immense ambition. Join us as we explore the nuances of this compelling figure, going beyond the usual narratives to uncover Khufu, the ruler, in all his audacity, ingenuity, and paradox. Chapter 6, Military Exploits From monumental pyramids to sprawling temples, Egypt's architectural marvels are often what first come to mind when we ponder this ancient civilization. But let's not forget, the empire was not built on limestone and manpower alone. It was also forged in the crucible of war. And at the helm of some of these military undertakings was Khufu, a pharaoh whose leadership extended far beyond grand construction projects. 
Imagine being a soldier in ancient Egypt, dust swirling around your chariot wheels as you follow your pharaoh into the unknown. With no GPS or satellite imagery, these campaigns were high-stake endeavors that required meticulous planning, resource allocation, and unyielding courage. The terrain was unforgiving, and the enemies were often as fierce as the desert sun. Though specific details are scarce, relics and inscriptions do give us fragmented glimpses of Khufu's military ambitions. One such vital area of interest was the Sinai Peninsula. Rich in valuable resources like turquoise and copper, control over Sinai was not just a matter of territorial gain but also economic foresight. These resources were crucial for everything from ornamentation to weaponry, a linchpin in Egypt's trade and military capabilities. Yet, Sinai was no empty wasteland for the taking. It was inhabited by Asiatics, as the Egyptians referred to them, people whose interests did not necessarily align with Egyptian expansionism. A campaign here wasn't merely a walkover, it was a calculated gamble that risked resources and lives. But why stop at Sinai? Whispers of expeditions also point further south, into the lands of Nubia. While the records are inconclusive, the strategic importance of Nubia, rich in gold and ivory, would have been an irresistible allure for a ruler of Khufu's ambition. Did his chariots roll past the first cataract of the Nile, flags bearing his name flapping in the wind? While we may never have definitive answers, such questions tantalize scholars and enthusiasts alike. Though these military exploits were secondary to his role as a divine ruler and builder, they were pivotal in shaping Egypt's geopolitical landscape. His campaigns not only secured valuable resources but also served to project Egyptian power and influence, reinforcing its status as a dominant force in the ancient world. Khufu's military strategy was about more than just battles and territorial gains, it was a complex tapestry interwoven with economic plans, diplomatic maneuvering, and long-term vision. As we put together the pieces of this fascinating puzzle, we invite you to reconsider Khufu, not just as a pharaoh of stone and monuments but as a ruler of flesh and blood, who took calculated risks to secure his empire's future. Strap on your virtual armor, clutch your imaginary spear, and mount your hypothetical chariot. We're about to ride through the annals of history, following the battle-hardened footsteps of Pharaoh Khufu. Hold tight, for this is a journey through uncharted deserts and untold tales, deep into the heart of a civilization that continues to captivate us to this day. Chapter 7, Cultural and Religious Impact Imagine a world where the realms of the divine and the earthly are entwined, where every gesture, every decree, and every stone laid is imbued with spiritual significance. This was ancient Egypt, a civilization whose cultural and religious tapestry was as intricate as the hieroglyphs adorning its temple walls. And at the epicenter of this complex web was the pharaoh, considered not merely a king but a god on earth. As we delve deeper into the legacy of Khufu, we find a man who transcended the role of a political ruler to become a defining force in the spiritual and cultural heritage of his nation. Picture yourself walking through the heart of an ancient Egyptian city during Khufu's reign. The atmosphere is a synesthetic blend of incense, prayers, and the sounds of artisans at work. Temples are more than mere buildings, they are bridges between the mortal world and the divine. As the high priest of these temples, Khufu was the linchpin in this sacred connection, overseeing religious rituals that would ensure ma'at, order, justice, and cosmic balance. The question looms large, was Khufu a spiritual revolutionary? While he may not have introduced a new religion, he certainly put his stamp on the existing spiritual practices. Some scholars even speculate that the inventory stela, though controversial in its authenticity, suggests Khufu's possible role in renovating the Temple of the Sphinx, emphasizing the continued veneration of ancient deities. But Khufu's influence was not restricted to the religious sphere. On the cultural front, his reign saw innovations in art and architecture. Let's not forget that the workers who built the Great Pyramid were not slaves but skilled laborers who lived in nearby workers' villages. Artifacts recovered from these sites reveal a society of craftspeople, artists, and clerks, all contributing to a vibrant cultural milieu. 
Whether it's the intricacy of jewelry design or the magnificence of monumental architecture, Khufu's era was an epoch of artistic exploration and achievement. Could Khufu have been a patron of literature as well? The ancient text known as the Papyrus Westcar hints at this tantalizing possibility. While not definitively attributed to his reign, this collection of stories featuring magicians and miracles is set in the royal courts of his family line. If Khufu had any role in its inception or propagation, it would be yet another testament to his far-reaching influence on Egyptian culture. So, was Khufu a pioneer in thought and culture? Did he set precedents that would resonate for millennia? The truth is as layered as the society he ruled. Khufu might not have been a revolutionary, but he was an evolver, subtly steering Egyptian culture and religion towards new horizons. As we piece together the fragments of ancient texts, artifacts, and inscriptions, a complex picture emerges, one that is both human and divine, earthly and eternal. Journey with us as we explore the nuanced world that Khufu crafted, through his decrees, his patronage, and his own persona. Let's navigate the labyrinthine corridors of spirituality and culture, and discover a pharaoh who was not just a man of his time, but a man for the ages. We've just explored the early life, rise to power, and reign of Pharaoh Khufu, from his court to his military endeavors and the impact he had on culture. But there's more to his story that we will cover in part 2. Don't miss out, subscribe and hit the notification bell for, Pharaoh Khufu Unveiled, Part 2.